year is 1987 and the FIFA Under-20 World Cup is taking place in Chile. It's won by a sensational Yugoslav side, featuring talents like Davo Šuka and Robert Poznetsky. Sadly, the team never fulfilled its full potential at senior level as politics split the squad between several new nations. 25 years earlier, in 1962, another great Yugoslav squad had arrived in Chile. They also had a world title in mind. They were Olympic champions, they'd finished runners-up in the first European Championship, and in a tournament without a clear favourite, they felt capable of winning the seventh FIFA World Cup. Milan Galic was captain. The partisan Belgrade forward had a great career for both club and country, scoring 37 goals in just 51 international appearances. Still, little tops the experience of a FIFA World Cup. The Yugoslav team was drawn in a group based in Arica. That's a town in the desert in the far north of Chile. Actually, it's a very pleasant tourist town. They had a lovely small stadium. There was a good pitch, and the accommodation was top-notch too. The Russians were our big rivals in the group, and they were located a bit further away from the town. We really couldn't wait for the start of that first game. It was against the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia had lost to the Soviet Union in the inaugural European Championship final in Paris in 1960. The tiny stadium in Arica was packed for the rematch. For footballing reasons and for political reasons, this was Yugoslavia's big chance for revenge. But in a bad-tempered game, the Yugoslavs failed to find a way past Lev Yashin and went down to two second-half goals. <laughs> They had an excellent defence and they were especially good on the counter-attack. They made the most of this and beat us just as they had done before. It was really hard for us to accept this defeat. I don't think any of us got a wink of sleep that night. We had come to the World Cup with a strong belief that we could do well, and this happened to us in our very first match. Yugoslavia's next game against Uruguay was now a must-win encounter. The South Americans had been champions 12 years previously and were still amongst the world's best. Cabrera gave them the lead after 19 minutes. <laughs> Yugoslavia equalised through a Skoblar penalty and soon afterwards forced their way through the Uruguayan defence again. <laughs> Our excellent centre-forward, Skoblar, took a shot from about 25 metres out. He hit it well, and the goalkeeper was unable to gather it. I ran in from the edge of the box, and I got to the ball before the keeper could recover. That goal put us 2-1 ahead. Galic wasn't the biggest forward, but he was fast and tricky. He ran rings around the towering Uruguayan defence, and his cross set up the third goal for Jurkovic. Yugoslavia went on to beat Colombia as well, and qualified safely for the quarter-finals. After playing in Arica and qualifying for the latter stages, we had to fly down to Santiago for our next match. There we were going to play the West Germans. Not only were they really strong, they didn't know the meaning of defeat. Of course, we were enthusiastic and very happy to have reached the quarterfinals. We'd never beaten the Germans before, but we were certainly going to give it our best. It was actually the third time in a row we'd faced the Germans at this stage, and we'd lost the other two games very narrowly. This time luck was on Yugoslavia's side, and the West Germans couldn't break through. With extra time, three minutes away, Galic attacked down the wing. We'd lost the midfield battle to the Germans, so we started to counter-attack down the wings. At that point, the ball came to me. 
I got past one German player and then managed to beat a second as well. And I got to the byline before their defender. I glanced up and saw one of our players approaching the penalty spot. I cut the ball back to him and he scored with a magnificent shot. That goal put us 1-0 in front. There was too little time for West Germany to recover. At the third time of asking, Yugoslavia had overcome the Germans and were in the semi-finals. They hadn't been that far since the first tournament in 1930. Facing them in Wiener del Mar were Czechoslovakia, and now Yugoslavia's luck started to change. Kadraba opened the scoring for the Czechs when Soskic failed to hold a shot. This, though, was a resilient Yugoslav team. Jekovic beat the Czech keeper to a through ball, and the scores were level. But with time running out, Scherer beat Yugoslavia's offside trap to restore the lead. This was not going to be Yugoslavia's day. So the Czechs were 2-1 in front following two relatively fortunate goals. As the game drew towards its close, we had a lot of chances. However, the Czech goalkeeper was amazing. He was in the form of his life. And we missed some chances that we simply couldn't believe. Of course, because we didn't score, the Czechs did. I remember the ball was on the right wing and then crossed into the box. Our central defender, for no reason at all, hit the ball with his hand. He actually jumped up and hit the ball with his hand. Of course, the referee had to give them a penalty. And from that, they got their third goal. So, in the end, we were unlucky to lose a game in which we were by far the better team. But that's football. It doesn't always turn out the right way. Sometimes the better team ends up losing. Yugoslavia were a formidable team and they could have been world champions. But with an Olympic title and European success, this was still a squad that achieved much. It was only the very biggest prize that escaped them.